Moderating our panel this morning on competencies and credentials as currency will be Mark Singer from Thomas Edison State University. Panelists include Dave Wilcox, President and CEO of Global Skills Exchange. We have John Dyer from American Association of Community Colleges and Danny King from Accredible. So please welcome. Um, well, we're gonna uh, continue on with the same, um, I, I guess we have the same title as what Joanne was just talking about, right? And, um, but I don't know if there's how much connection. We're not gonna do any linguistic analysis of any of the terms as far as I know. Because that was, it was covered really well. Thank you for that. So, um, so my name is Mark Singer. I'm at it is up there at Thomas Edison State University, which is an institution that's uh, focused entirely on adult and non-traditional learners. And uh, I just wanted to talk for a moment. Each of the panels will have a chance to to talk about um, his uh, perspective on on what we're doing here. But I did want to. Uh, say something like, uh, you know, so far in this, uh, in this summit, which I think has gone really well, there's been a lot of great questions from the audience, and I would encourage you to ask some of us, if, if any come to mind. But um, there's been especially a, a lot of discussions about access and diversity and, and, and uh, equity uh, in the last couple of days, and uh, we thought it was important to, uh, you know, sort of address the elephant in the room, which is that we are, you know, to look at us, not the most diverse group, but I, I should mention um, that, well, there's, there's one good thing is that, you know, I've, I've polled the other uh, panels here and it turns out we're entirely bias free, all of us. So uh, I, I think you'll get a wide range of pers It's not good, right? And, um, and the other thing is that we, we come from very different perspectives um, to this subject and so uh, we disagree on just about everything. So, so I, I think that'll, that'll really be interesting and feel free to call us out for whatever strikes your fancy. Um, that seemed like it would be worth uh, mentioning that. So, so with that in mind, I just want to talk about what my, briefly my perspective, and then we'll, panelists will each uh, explain something about where they're coming from on this. So um, Thomas Edison State University traditionally has done a lot of work in the field of prior learning assessment, uh, assessing what students already know, and, and uh, in our case, mapping that to um, our curriculum and our courses. So a few years ago, we realized that uh, that course-based model um, presented a real challenge, a serious challenge for a lot of our students because they would know some things, but not everything that would go into you know, the Intro to Calculus course. They might know the first two-thirds of it, or, or in another situation, they might know the practice that uh, was underlying a, a particular course, but not the theory. You know? And so we would say to them, well, you don't know all of it, you're not getting any credit. You'll have to start from the beginning. And so, so from that, we um, uh, realized that, well, we could provide students with modules or, or materials that would help them supplement what they already know. So um, that's how we got involved in open educational resources, and, and that's how we discovered the, the folks here at the Sailor Academy <coughs> as well, so we worked with them on a lot of projects like, like that. The idea was to sort of uh, fill in the gaps in, in students' learning. Um, and that really raised the question for us, like why are three credit courses the measure of a student's knowledge and the, student, uh, the measure of a student's progress toward a degree. And then we were like, well, why degrees also, you know? Um, so we started thinking uh, about who our students were and our students um, overwhelmingly in all of our surveys always say, I'm here because I wanna either move up in my career or change my career entirely. Uh, a few of them say, oh, you know, the satisfaction of having a degree, but they're, you know, that's not really true and, and it's, maybe just to impress their kids, you know, but that's really it. But most of them overwhelmingly are thinking about career pathways. Um, so then it really, we realized if that's the case, uh, it didn't really matter which course they were taking anyway. What was really important for our students was, do they have this set of skills that a degree was supposed to represent? You know, so um, my background's um, history. Uh, so it didn't really, we realized that, you know, there aren't many history majors at my school. and and. It didn't matter if they took 17th century history, 18th century history, diplomatic history, as long as I was able to teach them what the tools of the historian were and how to use them. Um, and so with that in mind, we realized, well, if we're compiling this set of tools or helping students compile this uh, ability to use this set of tools, right, um, students really ought to be able to, uh, to earn interim credentials on the way to that degree goal, you know, like certificates, badges, 
uh, things like that. So they ought to be able to, to, to apply what they know right away while they're working toward their degrees. And almost all of our students are part-time, so a lot of them are on the eight-year plan or something like that. Um, so, so this all that I just described to you was like a total revelation to us, you know? And so we start talking to people about this idea of like, you know, like little credentials, like badges or something like that. And then it turns out that through various other pathways, everyone else was already there. You know, so, so for us it was this revelation in, 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 in our higher ed sector, but, but everyone else here I think on, on this panel has come to this similar conclusion in a very different, uh, you know, from a very different direction. And um, uh, we all have in common, I think, our interest in, in these alternative credentials. Um, but what you'll hear today I think is, is a little bit about how those different pathways that we've taken um, have affected the way we think about these things now. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd just like to uh, allow the panelists to, to talk a little bit about who they are, what their perspective is on this. And might as well start with uh, Danny, since you're right next to me. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Accredible. And so we're a, a digital badging and digital certification platform. So I guess I'm coming at this from uh, the, the sort of technological lens. Um, also, you know, we have about 450 customers. and so. Lots of them are universities, lots of them are associations, lots of them are running online courses like Udacity and things like that. And so I get to see, uh, I'm really lucky, I think I get to see all these very different lenses um, of what different types of organizations are thinking about these kind of topics. So I'll try and represent those as best as I can. Um, you know, the, the way that, um, the, the, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide both the uh, technological foundation for a lot of the things we're talking about, but also the um, the cultural foundation too. You know, it's not just a tech problem. It is also about how does one evaluate these, and, and whether or not people actually do want to evaluate these is, is the challenge. You know, whether or not employer, employers are even considering things like badges and micro credentialing. So we're kind of looking at it from those those two lenses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dave? Okay, I'm Dave Wilcox with Global Skills Exchange. Um, actually, my background is in engineering, so I uh, tend to look at things through an engineering perspective. I'm looking for rational structure. And uh, I remember about six years ago, we had a meeting in Washington of some people that were, came together to talk about credentialing and talking about what some needs were. And, the, and one of the persons at the meeting put up a, a PowerPoint uh, showing all these intertwined lines. Have you seen that? Uh, you've probably have seen that picture. Um, it looked very, very complex. And so the question was, it's the, the obvious thing from an engineering standpoint is to say, well, look at all of this confusion and chaos in this marketplace. Um, but the more I've gotten involved in this work, the more chaotic it is. In other words, maybe that chart is the right way to look at things and not try to get straight lines everywhere to make everything perfectly rational. But to see the value uh, in the complexity, if it's effectively used and provides value to individuals and, of course, to employers. Um, and I'm going to take the term of, of currency. Uh, and by the way, the presentation just today, I keep changing my, my notes here a little bit because it had a lot of new perspectives and insight that I, I hadn't thought about. Uh, so I hope this is coherent. The, um, one of the things that, uh, but that actually came out of that and extended throughout the last, uh, the last few years as, uh, even though there might be a common definition of currency in some cases, is a way of describing uh, credentials in some kind of way that makes sense to the complexity of the marketplace. Uh, and so the, the thoughts were this, and we were engaged with uh, the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, with Lumina Funding, looking at, at um, what is a credential, and essentially, very simply, it's a package of competencies organized or packaged or framed in certain ways. But there weren't really uh, common ways of really talking about that or describing it. We looked at what Europe had done, and they had come up with a, a scaled approach. So degrees are here, uh, other types of credentials, lesser, I, I, I threw that in, sorry. Uh, other kinds of credentials <laughs> are at different levels. But in reality, when we looked at the underlying competency, it's the underlying credential itself, um, the unit of analysis was at the competency level. If we can't articulate those or think about those with a common framework or a common way of, of describing, then the credential is weak because its foundation is weak. Uh, so this, this led to the development of something called the credential framework. 
uh, which is, uh, lo uh, excuse me, well, it's a credential framework. I, I call it a competency framework, but it's a credential framework. It's saying that all credentials and competencies that really are the underlying value of the credential are, are an aggregate of knowledge, skills, and uh, what we call personal and social skills. In other words, the competency really is an aggregate. It's not one or the other. Some might be more important uh, in certain competencies than others, but really it's the aggregate. And we developed a, a, a eight-scale model um, to help people think that through. And we have found there's no perfect way of describing this because of the high variation of the way people think, uh, the context of different sectors and employer uh, uh, priorities. Uh, but we believe that this does add and contribute to improved signals uh, of, of the credential. Because the, the demand side, which is where more of my focus is really on, is uh, the demand side is looking for quality signals. They don't have to agree with them or think they're good, but they need to know what the signals are uh, so they can make, uh, make judgments. Um, we, we happen to be doing quite a bit of work for the Department of Defense. It's, it's, it's one of our bigger, bigger uh, uh, clients. And uh, we've learned a lot there as well that, that feeds back into my thinking about, about the supply side. That um, they, they have a concept uh, called readiness. You might have heard that. It means that um, the goal is to get everyone at a ready state to support mission. Uh, so it means when I'm in a certain situation, and I call on you to perform the function, you know what you need to know, you need to know at the right time, you need to be able to apply it in the right context. Getting to that place has been the challenge. Uh, and, but that's, that's what they do, and they think about this. And we're looking right now at the whole cyber arena a little bit, and saying that people can learn about cyber. Probably every college in the country has a cyber program. It's a big demand area, and a lot of people want to take courses in cyber. There are several certifications. CompTIA has one, and others have, have um, actually uh, 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 certifications. In fact, we help DOD build a certification structure for the use of those certifications. Um, but we're just, talking, we're just uh, talking to the Army. Army's not happy. I don't really care whether they've had a degree or sort of, is I want to know, can a person perform that function effectively in a live fire environment? Meaning to me that there is then a question here of what the signals mean, not in, 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 in the generality of signals, but the signals in a specific context. And so, to, and I think that, some of you may say, well, we have this competency, but the competency, I have a great golf swing. There is no, I mean, every, every instructor I've ever had say, you've got that technique right. Oh, I should be credential. Uh, it doesn't play out in context. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, my scores are not very good. Uh, when, when I actually have to actually do it, it's a very different story. So uh, the, the, the way I look at this is uh, in this ecosystem, there are multiple players, all bring value. And it's the quality of the signals uh, that make the demand side, which really is the one that judges value in their context, um, have the right kind of signals that they can make effective judgments about. Uh, uh, we'll get but, but, but I will move. <laughs> I, uh, I will move. No. Some other thoughts maybe later? No, because otherwise, otherwise I'll have no questions to ask. Yeah, no questions. Right. I was going <laughs> yeah. to answer them all up front. So. <laughs> oh, please. <yeah. laughs> um, and so we should, uh, John. Sorry. Good, Good morning. morning. No, no. Um, I come at this from two perspectives. On the one hand, I'm the Director of Workforce and Economic Development at the American Association of Community Colleges, which is the membership organization for roughly 1,100 two-year degree granting institutions across the country. From, from my formal hat perspective, I care about students getting family-sustaining wage jobs and keeping them. Full stop. That's what I care about. From an additional perspective, I have spent the last couple of years working with uh, Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, and in particular with Susan Lupo, whom you heard from yesterday, on a project called The Right Signals. That project is funded by Lumina Foundation, and it was based on a pretty simple premise. There is, as we all know, a plethora of credentials out there degrees, certificates, badges, licenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we wanted to look at 
with a small cohort of colleges moving fast and doing good work was how the colleges and the credentials could send the right signals about what those credentials meant to three audiences. Audience number one, employers. Audience number two, the institutions themselves, between and among colleges. Audience number three, the students. Can the student actually articulate what the hell this piece of paper or this badge means about what they know and about what they can do? And so we were very fortunate to be able to set this up as a sandbox. We took an open application process. We picked, or I should, maybe I shouldn't say we picked, 20 colleges distinguished themselves in the process uh, that were then selected to participate over a period of 18 months. And unlike most projects, we were not prescriptive. We said, you must do two things. Number one, you must try out this thing. You must beta test this thing called the credentials framework. You'll love it. It's a four-page fold-out. It looks really awesome and current. Um, and you must map at least one credential to a degree or certificate. You must lay out what the competencies are. And so we had 20 very different approaches and 20 different things that people were trying to do. Everything from trying to use competency mapping and credentials as part of guided pathways, to laying out entire programs for an industry, to one school that was doing competency mapping across humanities courses, you name it, all kinds of things. So that's really the other lens that I bring to this. We're just wrapping up the project now, but we've seen amazing things and are anxious to go on and do a second round with perhaps another set of colleges, perhaps some of the same. Stay tuned. That's great. So, um as I mentioned before, yeah, we're, we're all sort of converging on this from a number of different perspectives. I, I, I guess well, we have some poll questions. We should probably ask them, right? I mean, um, we went to the trouble of Jackie typed them out. So um, uh, the first one's really easy. Like you'll know the answer to this for yourself right away. It's over here somewhere. But just it, it would give us a sort of a better read on the room, and it's it takes a minute. Yeah, we, all right, we'll stall. I'll, I'll you know. Um, all right, there it is. And it's in the app, if you have the app. And it basically, uh, oh, some people have already voted. Have, have you yourselves you know, earned an alternative credential of some sort or other? And I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but uh, um, all right, it's actually, well, now it's tied. All right, so half the room has, half the room hasn't. Um, I would presume that even the ones of you who have not uh, are familiar with how these things work in some ways, though, right? We'll, we'll hear about different approaches to this different types in a minute. All right, the no's are, are starting to win. All right, so it's roughly even. Thank you. Um, so, so I guess the, the question I had, since there is this convergence, you know, when I, like I said, when we got to that space, we realized, oh, a lot of people were already there, and we're not as smart as we thought we were. But um, um, where, I, I, what I'd like to ask the panel is, where, where do you see this demand for alternative credentials coming from? Like, what's, what's driving it? I mean, weren't colleges and universities already doing a good enough job of credentialing people that we didn't really need these things at all. I'll, I'll jump on that one if you'd <laughs> like. Um, so the community college perspective is a little bit different perhaps from the perspective of a four-year degree institution or a terminal degree institution. Uh, because there are so many programs that one might uh, classify as career technical education, that's where credentials traditionally have lived more. And there are the ones we all know about. In order to become a nurse, it is not simply enough to have graduated with an associate's degree. In nursing, one needs also to pass the NCLEX and become licensed as a nurse. That's a, sort of the classic example of a credential. If you wish to become a welder, you may well take welding classes, but you will probably need to take the AWS exam and possibly the ASME exam if you wish to weld pipe etc., etc., etc. Many community colleges have reached the conclusion that every degree or certificate that's offered ought to be complemented by an industry-recognized credential. And I use that term very deliberately. A credential, I would argue, needs to be industry-recognized or what is the, otherwise you're just pushing a rope. 
Uh, and, I, and I really feel pretty strongly, with the question was asked earlier about the credential explosion, I would argue that the answer that was missing, no disrespect intended, was employers demanding them. That's what will cause the, the explosion, will be employers demanding these credentials and understanding what they mean. I think, so I've talked with a, a lot of recruiters. Uh, we're doing a bunch of market research at Accredible, and we're launching you know, verification products and trying to connect people's credentials to actual employment opportunities. So I, I think I interviewed something like 60 or 70 recruiters recently. Uh, and one message I got, and, and this was across, you know, white collar, blue collar, you know, high tech, low tech, um, mostly folks on the US though. Um, and one message I got loud and clear was that um, generally, you know, they are looking for something like a degree as a baseline requirement. Um, and I think that is starting to change, though, because in, especially in smaller companies, they were a lot more open-minded about what credentials you had as this sort of baseline requirement. You know, the bigger ones, you need to have a degree, or maybe you need to have done the GRE or something like that. And they won't even interview you until you've done that. Um, but a lot of the smaller ones, you know, if you're hiring a programmer and you've done a coding boot camp instead of, you know, gone to a, a degree-granting institution to do it, they're a lot more open-minded about that. And I think we're just at the very beginning of that starting to change. Um, but you know, a message I got loud and clear was that, look, we need you to have this certain baseline, uh, sort of low, like low bar that you need to first cross, and, and the, a degree is a nice and easy way to do that. But then they don't really care about the content of that degree. They want to sit you down and interview you, or maybe train you up themselves, because they each look at it so differently. Um, so I think there is appetite for something higher resolution than I have a degree. Um, and there is also appetite for finding those, you know, I heard the phrase diamonds in the rough a few times, you know, and think, you know, there, there is open-mindedness. Um, but there is a problem I kept coming up against, which was uh, nobody's ever going to get fired for hiring you know, an MIT graduate, even if the MIT graduate was terrible at their job. Right? Um, but you would get fired if you hired someone from some random coding boot camp. Uh, and so there is a risk implied. And we, we need to find a way, I think, to get around you know, that risk. Hmm. Dave, did you want to comment? Right, right, I'm just looking at it from, from a little uh, a different point of view. The, uh, getting some, someone to the point of where they are credentialed for employment um, and in my view of this, is about uh, a third of, of, of the game. Uh, there are far more people employed than are unemployed. <laughs> That's a gigantic market of people that will benefit from multiple forms of credentials. Um, so employment is just a beginning point, it seems to me. And colleges, many colleges, take it to the point of getting the degree. The issue is uh, people trend transverse many different career paths. And I'm sure many of us have been, and we need access to new learning, new forms of degrees. Deloitte just said that the average person has 1% of their work time available for learning. That's 20 hours a year. Uh, so uh, how, does, how does our credentialing community serve what I think is this lifelong need in some way? Um, and I think that's where alternative models, alternative credentials have to be a piece of the total picture, not to replace uh, the, the, uh, uh, the foundational, but to take it to full value. I can one short example. Um, I was a licensed professional engineer 45 years ago. I haven't done engineering in 35 years. I still have the credential. Um, I put on my wall. Uh, hmm. I think you see it on my wall uh, uh, up there. Yeah, it's, I'm very proud of it. Uh, it cost me $5,000 or it's $200 every, every two years. The problem is it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's a bit of a fraud, actually, for me to even have it. <laughs> now, uh, in the new world, at the time I deserved it. Uh, I give me credit for that. But uh, the world has changed. It's no longer sufficient. Uh, and can the, and the, can the community of... of uh, a credentialers and, and actually credential providers look at complex and many forms of, of, of ways of enhancing me or others throughout their, their hmm. so I guess, navigation. Thank you. This, this leads me to something that I, I don't want to make this just about the things I'm interested in, but um, do, does this suggest that higher ed's not really responding to the evolving market fast enough? I mean, if we're, if we're having these credentials out there that we have stood behind, and yet they're not, they don't have the meaning that we wanted them to have? I mean, I haven't thought there... about that. Yeah? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, 
The original movement in 89 towards IT certifications was written by a, a, a friend of many years at, at that time, Department of Ed, said, an alternative uh, universe. At that time, in that 89 paper, uh, Cliff wrote that, talked, with, uh, talked about the parallel universe. A certification would become a way around what it perceived at the time as being uh, characterized by the way you just characterized, a uh, now response to the market. Um, since then, there's been a proliferation of certifications, five to 10,000 and more every day. Uh, part of that's driven by what was seen as the right answer. Uh, some work and some don't work. But I think it's, in a, search, it's a search for um, a, a, a tighter relevancy between the providers of credentials and the users. And uh, there are issues on both sides. So I think certification became a response in many cases to what was seen as a, a, a slowness of education to respond to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. But that was in 89, that was uh, yes. a, a few and years it was, ago. Yes, it was driven by IT, which was that time the emerging occupational area. Uh, but then it came to be seen as the instrument. And it is a useful and important instrument, but not the only uh, forms of, of credentialing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that's just far too much red meat for me to pass out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the risk when we use a term like higher ed is we imply some sort of great homogeneous mass that all thinks and does the same thing. Western Governors University is not Edison State, is not uh, Miami-Dade Community College, is not a small tribal college in northern Oklahoma. Hi, you know, we say we're the American Association of Community Colleges. We say that, that all of our college, we love all our colleges equally. They're, they're, they're all members and each of them is special, like they're children. They're special all in their own way, and they are. But to suggest that higher ed moves in some kind of group think or in some uh, unified way, I think is just not the reality. So at a community college, you would be hard pressed to find a program of study that did not have an advisory board made up of representatives from industry who advise on curriculum and advise on instruction and who in many cases offer work-based learning opportunities, whether those internships, apprenticeships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do the quality of some of those advisory boards vary from program to program and school to school? Sure. But I, I suspect, for example, if you were going on to the campus of a four-year school and asked to meet with the advisory board for a program, you might get some more blank looks than you might at a community college. So I think, I think there's just a danger in that homogeneity. There are very different approaches based on different needs and based on different missions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, we, we work with something like 60 or 70 universities to issue badges or certificates or both. Um, and they all have completely different ideas about what a badge should be for versus a certificate versus, you know, uh, how high stakes one should be versus the other. And yeah, so there is no homogeneity in, in higher education. I think generally not a bad thing as well, but we are trying to force these standards a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, there is, there is tension there, I think. Yeah. Well, that, that is, that's another question I had prepared ahead of time uh, uh, right there is, um, is, so if, if there is this kind of uh, emergence of, of different kinds of standards, uh, serving different kinds of purposes, uh, originating different places, uh, is, is there a, a, any danger of uh, these, uh, this explosion in credentials? Was that actually what you said? Uh, uh, revolution. Revolution, thank you. All right, that's, that's a little cleaner. Uh, um, uh, will that lead to more confusion? Uh, you know about uh, what what skills represent, or, or you know how do you it, should we be working toward a common standard, or is it okay for it just to represent different things to different people in different situations? Oh man, I, yeah, so I'm an engineer uh, by background, and I would love a standard. I love standards. I was there trying to solve that gear problem, and you know, um, but it, it does seem currently that we're we're a little too early for it. Um, but I think that we will get to something like that over time. But what I think we'll need is. Um, I'm sure Dave can talk at length about this, of course, um, is we're going to have a basic standard, and that will be the, the sort of basis. Uh, but then each organization and also each individual will have a very different narrative about what each course meant to them and what that means they can do for an employer. And I think it's quite important the individual controls a lot of the narrative about what they feel they can do 
and how they feel they can prove that. Um, and so I think we need to put a lot of the, the, the sort of tooling in the hands of the individuals and to a lesser extent in the institutions as well and try and standardize less, you know, we're a one size fits all program and more, okay, well, this is like the basics that we can guarantee someone will have and let them communicate, oh, and that meant that this person will excel at this. Uh, a couple of examples, you know, one I love to give is me versus my co-founder, Alan. He's our CTO, I'm the CEO. Both went to the same school, Durham University in the UK, same course, computer science. Uh, graduated with actually almost exactly the same grade, same piece of paper, but we have opposite skills. And you have to literally sit us down and interview us to try and figure out the difference between us. Um, but if I could you know, make my own narrative on, on my credential itself, I think that, that would be different. Um, going a little further, you know, before I went to college, um, I actually did not do very well in, in uh, a few of my subjects. Math was a big one. And if you want to do computer science uh, in the UK, we have a very rigid you know, college applications process. You can only apply to about six schools. It's like a government regulated system. Um, there's really not a lot of getting around it. And I just didn't get the grades I needed to go to the school I wanted to go, Durham. Um, I kind of hustled my way in anyway. Um, and I, I more or less failed math. I got like a D in math. It was really bad. Um, but then I graduated top of my class in computer science. And so, you know, the resolution that we're judging kids by is very low. You know, you know, it's like, we think that if you take this really standardized course, then you'll have the ability to do these other things on average. And on average, that is true. But how many people are exactly on that median? Um, and I think we need a much higher resolution image of like, well, this person actually can demonstrate, you know, that they can do this. So let's let's take a chance on them. Just, just have a quick thought on it. I, I think the employer demand signal is a, is a, is a, uh, problematic to some degree. The um, because the signals come from people who are. All, uh, there are many good things, by the way, so I'm not being overly critical. What we're trying to do is uh, take it one step further. The interface of demand is not at the HR office or the employment office. It's at the business process level and functional level. If we can correlate and relate competency to risk to successful business process, successful operational processes, then we have a clear value-driven signal. Uh, like if I know that particular skill is, would introduce high risk if it's not sufficient to a particular business objective, then I relate that as my demand signal. Mm -hmm. And some aggregation would be necessary to. That's, I think that's getting to the resolution question. Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Okay. A couple of quick points. Um, there's a certain tension for a community college because on the one hand, a community college is obliged to prepare students for jobs that are available in the community. The, co the college is of the community and is expected to serve the community. So on that basis, the credentials that they offer should, and we hope in fact do, reflect the need and the demand within that community. At the same time, a community college still wants to prepare students who are able to be globally competitive. And so there's a certain tension there that needs to be worked out, I think, over time. I would uh, be remiss if I didn't throw in, though, a pitch for the uh, Connecting Credentials Framework on which Corporation for Skilled Workforce has done so much work because it serves, I think, as a truly effective translation tool between programs, between courses, between degrees and certificates that allows you to understand what things represent and what they mean. So if you haven't looked at the tool, do so, please. Um, gosh, we've already addressed so many issues broadly. I mean, this is good. This is good. Um, um, I guess uh, one of the things I'm trying to uh, last week in Inside Higher Ed, uh, one of their bloggers, Joshua Kim, talked about alternative credentials, and in, um, he said it was pretty much a certainty for him that alternative credentials, uh, the kinds of things we're talking about, uh, should be complementary to traditional credentials like a degree and not uh, replace them. You know, but, but we've been talking about this often on the, the last uh, few days, last couple times we met. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, well, I guess what, what, I, what I'd like to ask you is, have, have we settled that? I mean, are, are, you know, one of, the, one of the ways I took what he was saying was, uh, uh, raised the question for me is, are, are these alternative credentials add-ons uh, that are needed because a degree doesn't tell you about a graduate skills or, or uh, uh, does this mean that degrees, well, as you said, they're sort of the baseline, but, um, but are they, because they're only a baseline, have they lost some relevance in some way? I mean, so what's the proper relationship between alternative credentials and more traditional ones? Thank you. Gosh, uh, I don't know, um, but 
So, well, first of all, it's really hard to define an alternative credential. I'm not yeah. sure anyone really agrees on what that means, because some of them are high stakes, some of them are low stakes. A couple of high stakes examples, you know, we, uh, a couple of our customers are, are Google, Docker, New Relic. Uh, the, these, are, these are companies that are not education companies, but they have an education arm. So Google trains you how to be a you know, certified Google engineer, right? And, um, Docker is, it's, you know, it's a, a technology. Um, and so the best people to learn about being Docker certified are Docker themselves. And they're starting to launch their own sort of training programs. And these are often requirements as well. You need a degree. You need to show that you're a programmer or something. Um, but um, you also need to show that isn't enough nowadays. Uh, in many, you know, I need to be Amazon Web Services certified or, you know. And so um, nowadays, I think that those alternative credentials uh, are becoming quite important and quite high stakes and communicating what they are and, and and, and what you can bring to an organization once you've done that training is a challenge. Um, but then, you know, way on the other side, you've got companies like, you know, Udacity or Coursera, who, who have been mentioned today. I think um, Jackie mentioned that. And um, uh, sorry, Joanne. Sorry. Um, and who, I think they're really. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> it's, a um, nice, it's a nice name. Yeah. You know. I think no one really knows uh, often what, what value they bring. But often, I think it's obvious they bring a lot of value to some people um, because it shows that you're staying current and things like that. So some employers are very much looking for you having done Coursera and Udacity courses. Um, but it's really hard to know. And, and different employers have such different mindsets on this. Different people in, different in the same organization will have very different mindsets on this. Um, so I'm not sure. And I think that we're just so early that we need a sort of cultural layer to sort of bubble up. Um, and, and we need to work a little bit on that before we can start to try and define it. So I, I think apparently it's my role on the panel to be the designated equivocator. So the answer is it depends. So if you come to a community college, you might wish to only become a licensed nursing assistant over a period of however many weeks to take the class, go to a nursing home typically or a hospital, do the work-based learning, take the various tests, walk away with a license. You don't need a degree. You don't need any or sort of traditional mm -hmm. academic marker. You need this piece of paper issued by the state that says you are licensed to do the work. Likewise, if you want to become a commercial driver, driving a big truck, you can come to a community college in many, in many states and take the coursework necessary to become a commercial driver. Sometimes that will be a credit, not very often, but occasionally, that is a credit-bearing program in which you will receive a certificate, rarely a degree, but a certificate. But you don't really care about that. What you care about is the piece of the paper from the state that says you are medically cleared, you have passed the tests, you are drug-free, and you can actually go out and get paid to drive a truck for a living. Yeah. At the same time, I do think the question is not so much, are there too many certificates or is it getting too confusing, so much as it is, are the certificates that are being issued clear to students, clear to employers, and clear between um, and among institutions about what they represent, the skills, knowledge, and abilities that actually underpin those things? If that isn't clear, then I, then I would say, yes, why do, you want it? why do you want to offer something that nobody knows what it means? I'd love to build on that. I think that's so important. Um, you know, we're in this age now where um, we know so much information about people that you know you can advertise. If you have, a, if you're selling baby toys, right, you can find pregnant women in DC and sell them baby toys on Facebook, right? That's the resolution that we can. But why can't we do that for careers? It's insane to me that we have more information about which restaurant I go to and whether or not I will statistically like it than which <laughs> job I'll get and whether or not I'll be good at it and enjoy it. And yet I spend most of my life working. Why is that? That's insane to me. And so I think we need to get really good at figuring out, OK, what do employers need? And how can we communicate and understand that? What are schools providing? And, and the learners in the middle, you know, how, to what extent are they meeting those? And match them. You know? And we've, we've solved it in other easier you know, places. I think that you know, this is a, we, we could use the lessons we've learned in places like advertising, not for you know, the, making you spend money, but actually getting you a great job that you'll love. And, where you'll provide the, the best work that you could. And I think you know, right now, if you're trying to get a job, it's a horrible process. And if you're trying to find a person to employ, it's a horrible process where it's inefficient. You, know, you might interview 100 candidates. And if you're lucky, one of them will be a really great fit, if you're lucky. Um, and the flip side is you, know, you might apply to like 20 or 30 you know, places, but you, you're doing it from a, 
often a point of desperation where if I don't get a job, I'm not paying rent next month or something like that. So will you really get the right job for you or will you just get the best of a bad bunch, right? And I think that we're ready now as a society to get enough data on both sides and match people because of you know, innovations in things like credentialing and because of you know, standards like connecting credentials and so on where it's slowly coalescing into what I think you know, will be a much more efficient way to get a job, which is, hey, here are seven jobs which you're already qualified for. Three of them want to interview tomorrow, yes or no. You know, that, that I think could be the future if we just sat down and collected mm -hmm. the data. And I'm also struck by, uh, I guess it was Michael Saylor's example yesterday of uh, using your phone as a transponder to just go into a room and scan it and say, oh, this is how many people have scuba diving licenses or, or, or you know, something like that. And I don't know if that's something that people are actively contemplating? Yeah, so you know, we do, we're about to release the ability to put things like certificates on your um, Apple wallet and on your Android wallet like you can with boarding passes and things like that. And so it's only one step away from being able to really qu quickly you know, share these things and communicate. Um, but I think that you know, um, the, the tech ecosystem has solved this in way less important areas. And we just need to apply that learning to something like this. And you know, it just takes um, uh, not just the technological side, but the cultural side to kind of want that. Um, and I think, you know, it just takes a few examples. And so you need to first solve it in a niche area like, okay, great, well, we solved it for this, you know, uh, this one example company where they were willing to hire all these people in a much faster way and they had way better outcomes. And I think we need to show case studies and just do research on yeah. what is possible. Um, and, but, you know, give it 10 years. I think the way you apply for jobs and get jobs will be much more pleasurable for everyone involved. Yeah, I, I just based on this, these thoughts, uh, I think, it all depends is the right answer here. Uh, overly, structured, overly structured relationships between credentials might be a barrier to the ability to be more agile. Um, I think getting a job first is an attractive option for many people in the country. Uh, we're working on a project now with um, an equip project where people have gotten manufacturing jobs. Um, this is good. Um, but then there's, they're seen as value of having a broader credential or a foundational credential for career or business purposes. So how they relate or connect, uh, they need to connect and to clear signals as a way to help them, mm. help them connect. So if you're tweeting about this, I think it all depends should be the, the dominant, uh, the theme that keeps coming back. Um, Maybe I, I don't know. Yeah, or I don't know, we, would, we don't know. Well, I, I don't want to speak for everyone here because we're very different. But, um, uh, Danny, you actually raised a, a question that I, that I did want to ask about, which is, you know, if, if, if some of these credentials, and again, it depends on which ones we're talking about, um, but if a lot of them are measuring those, uh, I, I know we don't want to say soft skills, life readiness skills, work readiness skills, that sort of thing, a lot of them are things that happen outside of the classroom. Um, you could conceivably be recording your progress toward some of these, uh, to mastery some of these skills as, you know, as you go through your daily life. Um, but it certainly raises the question of uh, privacy. You know, how intrusive um, should these kinds of uh, measurements of what you're doing, uh, how, how, you know, how intrusive should they be? I mean, we have, as it turns out, two people with engineering background on, on, on the panel. No? Okay, good. All right. Um, Sorry. But, uh, it, you know, there, there's a whole, it, it raised for me the question of uh, the Taylorism, you know, where you do these time and motion studies of workers to try to make their, uh, what they do more efficient and, and you capture all of the things that, they're, that go into what they do in their daily lives. I mean, is there a concern or should we be concerned about that kind of thing intruding uh, into this new world of credentialing? I'll take that one. Please. Mm. No. Okay. Thank you. Good Next. night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in, it, it's, it's an interesting question, particularly as it relates to soft skills. Um, there's, again, from the community college perspective, there's this notion that, oh, we need to teach soft skills because our students aren't getting soft skills. I think, in fact, there's a lot more soft skills teaching that goes on than anybody recognizes. It's just that nobody identifies it as such. So when the welding instructor comes to class in a, presenting in a particular way in terms of dress and cleans the workspace in a particular way and works with students in a particular way, the instructor doesn't necessarily tell her students, I'm doing this because this is what you are going to be expected to do when you go into the workplace and you should model it because it is a soft skill. And yet that's exactly what's going on. And you can look at that across multiple careers and multiple competencies that in fact there is a soft skills component that's actively being taught 
just nobody ever bothers to name it. And, and, and I will go back again to the credentials framework, and I'm not getting paid to do these promotions, but I, <laughs> I might as well say it. Um, there is the ability within the framework to identify where and how those things are being taught. If, t if a medical assistant has a competency that involves filling out a chart in of a patient's medical history, there is an implied soft skill there because that soft skill has to be, has the ability to ask sensitive questions with some level of grace and dignity and record the answers accurately. Part of it is getting the answers right is clearly, is clearly a competency. Doing it with grace and dignity and not making the patient feel like an idiot and doing it with some degree of privacy, those are clearly soft skills in my mind. Working in an office environment while doing it is a soft skill because you have to be able to play well with others in an office environment. Mm -hmm. We just don't ever name them as such when we're teaching them. I, th I think that's, uh, so I love this topic and I think it's so important. Um, just to address the privacy point briefly, to me it's trivially obvious that individuals should control how and where their own credentials are represented and what they say. We talked about Taylorism before and um, absolutely, you know, the, the, the classically trained percussionist versus rock band drummer, I uh, loved that example, uh, and it's one that we all just do naturally, but our credentials are terrible at being molded into, you know, make different arguments towards different stakeholders. But um, yeah, you know, some things that um, I've seen our customers do uh, along this, um, which I think is uh, not structured at all, and that might become a bit of a problem, but for now it's a sort of stopgap, um, is, you know, on uh, one of the benefits of things like digital credentials is you can put things like evidence portfolios at the bottom of them. So, you know, Rosetta Stone, for example, um, if you have a Spanish language certificate, you can have a video of you speaking Spanish on the certificate. And, you know, it's not just saying, Rosetta Stone, say you can speak Spanish at level three or whatever. It's, let me hear your accent. Let me see how, how personable you are. Let me see if you're, you know, are you kind of introverted or extroverted? And, you know, you start to see these kind of softer things emerge. If they're, even if they're not sort of formally defined, they kind of emerge. You know, one thing that you'd ask to do a lot of is a lot of project-based learning, and then you can see where did this student really shine? Did they love the project management side of stuff? Or was it more the, like the, the user interface design, or was it more, you know, the programming or whatever? And they're doing this, they're not, they're not explicitly saying, I'm a great, you know, X or Y. They're saying, hey, look at, the, look at let me provide you with my own narrative about what it was I felt I was good at. Um, and I thought that was very powerful because you have that baseline credential, plus you have the individualized narrative. Um, and I think it's tragic that you, know, you graduate from university after two years or after four years or something like that, and we hemorrhage all this information about who you are, what you're passionate about, in, inside of school, but also the extracurricular activities. We hemorrhage that and we summarize it down into a GPA. You're a name and a number, and that's it, right? And that's, that's how we're judging people today. When in fact, we have all that information already. You know, if you go to your friends, they will be able to find you a really great job for you because they know about you and they know what you're interested in and they've seen that evidence. Um, and so, you know, I think we should collect that, put it on the credentials and have it in an unstructured, messy form, at least initially, but still use the standard that, you know, employers are used to, but just give them extra information so they can look at that before, you know, they press reject. Just, I'll, just add a, I'll just add a quick thought to that. The, um, so I, I think we all recognize soft skills are important. Um, and there's a lot being done to support the development of those skills. The, uh, uh, the, the, the risk I see a little bit on the soft skills side uh, is the fact that it's soft. <laughs> In other words, we can define, uh, do we have standard definitions? Uh, an old project I did about 35 years ago, looking at engineering creativity. And uh, part of it was, are you better in teams? Are you, so the word teamwork has always been a nervous phrase for me. Because we use, uh, uh, team, teamwork's a good idea. I don't know if would disagree with the good idea. But we also use teamwork behavior as weapons. Uh, in other words, I can say, well, you're not a good team player because uh, that often has many dimensions to that judgment other than a, a, a solid definition. That makes sense what I'm saying here. Yeah. I can say you're not a good team player because you don't agree with me or you're always raising different issues or you're, you see what I'm saying, a little bit. We need clear definitions of those terms or we run the risk of, of introducing uh, um, variables that really uh, are not uh, uh, good or, or healthy for equity issues and for other, other reasons. Well, since, since you bring up the question of equity issues, I, I, I want to be aware of the time and, and give you all a chance to ask questions as well. But um, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that has also come up a bit when we talk about uh, 
you know, sort of uh, alternative credentials or credentials as this kind of currency is that uh, they seem to represent, and for some people, a move toward a, a more merit-based uh, a system of measuring people's skills, you know, and rewards. Um, so this kind of meritocracy idea is in the background. But um, um, aren't we always sort of deciding? Uh, you, well, we might be thinking about how to expand access, and, and credentials might be a way to do that. But but aren't we always sort of deciding winners and losers when we decide? Well, this person has this credential, this one doesn't. Uh, is there a way to design credentials that would uh, promote increased access and equity? Jumping off the point you, you just made. We, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Is, is really often the assessment of those skills is really where we, um, we need to be very, very careful about our assessment models and about, because that's where uh, biases starts to play out, both if it's a standardized test, biases play out in standardized tests, but they, at least in the standardized test arena, there are legal standards for that. Uh, but a lot of other assessments are not legal standards or assurance of compliance with any kind of uh, guidelines. So I think assessment design is, is a place within the credentialing world where, where uh, a, a better work can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. So I, I think, um, as I think about, about equity and access, um, I, I like to think that of all the alternatives out there, I think community colleges do a pretty good job. They're open access institutions. Uh, they clearly are competitive. Maybe competitive is not a strong enough word when it comes to cost. Uh, it's a fraction of the cost in many cases of a, a four-year institution. Uh, I pulled, I took the liberty of pulling the numbers from our latest set of, we put out something called Fast Facts every year because it's a nice handy cheat sheet of stuff. If you look at undergraduates writ large across the United States, uh, community college repre students represent 41% of all undergraduates, 40% um, of first time freshmen, 56% of Native American students, 52% of Hispanic students, 43% of black students, 40% of Asian Pacific Islander students. I think while we can always do better, I think we're, we're at least trying to attack the equity question. I think because we deal with so many non-traditional students in addition in terms of part-time, older, uh, all kinds of returning students, people launching new careers, I think that the more credentials we offer that are industry recognized, I think we are actually aiding in equity in access. I got one, one, yeah, one last little thought. Um, one of the challenges around the whole question of verification that came up uh, earlier, what there is not sufficient verification of is the impact or effect of the credential on uh, a lot of research and a lot of standards around its development, about its design, more process standards. But can I predict impact, can I predict result is where we're still missing a lot. So the world of AI and all of that will, I think, bring about change where we can actually start to observe, was there economic benefit or a business benefit or a mission benefit for having one or multiple credentials? So I can start to predict their value. Once it moves to a data site, I think that will be a kind of an equalizer in a lot of ways, but we haven't really done, no one wants to, put the, no one wants to spend the money to do that side of the work very often. I will say that at the local level, that's happening every day with industry uh -huh. advisory boards. That's exactly what they sure. do. Sure. As long as you have the right industry advisory yeah. boards yeah. we were talking about, right? All right, good. Well, uh, um, we're close to the end of our time, and I wanted to, I don't, I don't know if people are jumping, you know, to ask questions, but I'd like to give everyone the opportunity if there's a roving microphone or something around there. Anybody? Oh, good, good. So, uh, yeah, we've got uh, two, three minutes left. If we don't, can we ask them questions? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Should we start there and, and uh, yeah. yeah? All right, good. Uh, questions from anyone? We've covered the whole thing. Oh, there's there one right go. in the center there. Thank you for your sacrifice. Yes. <laughs> He's good. Take up for the team. I'd be interested to get the panel's thoughts on just the, the process of um, getting to the point where the employers, the people writing job descriptions are thinking of the jobs 
in the credentialing language where they can send out the signals for students to then figure out how to do the matching. Because when I think about where the rubber meets the road, you have people trying to translate jobs into skill sets, and you have people trying to translate skill sets into resumes. Like, you know, how, how do we get to the point where the employers are able to translate jobs, not just the technical ones, which I think have already been effectively done, and those were sort of the low-hanging fruit, but to other jobs where a little bit more complex into a series of badges or credentials to aid the matching process? Hmm. Great question. Thanks. Um, how this might change the process of uh, hiring? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't hear that. I will say one, one thing that I think helps with that is, is the growth in work-based learning opportunities. When you see more students doing their learning in the job site, I think employers begin to understand better what it is that the job is. And, and before I came to work for the American Association of Community Colleges, I worked for 15 years at a small, <coughs> excuse me, rural college. Part of my job was, was this work in working with employers. And I, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. Say there are employers are sometimes the last people who know what the actual job is. You have to go down on the shop floor and talk to the people who are doing the job, whatever that, whether it's in a hospital or a manufacturing plant or a real estate office or anywhere else. But, but I think that the more you, you advance work-based learning opportunities for students, the more that, that means you have more employers engaged in the educational process. I think that begins to ease the tension you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, organizations like Connecting Credentials are uh, the first step in that, and I think we need more like that. Um, and I, I think the biggest problem for this, though, is uh, getting employers, who are not a homogenous group at all, um, to change the way they think about recruiting and, and their processes. That's hard. That's really, you try and gather you know, 70 universities to do the same thing. That's nothing compared to this. And I think the way you get around that um, is you need to give them something that they just fundamentally couldn't have done before. You know, it, was the, it was the example I gave before where you're not going to get fired if you hired somebody with like, an MIT credential, even if they turn out to be really terrible. The, the way you, I think you get around that is by providing some sort of system or tool or something like that where they can get something just fundamentally better. It's worth taking that risk. Um, so finding the diamonds in the rough, uh, although I don't think that's a great way to look at it, personally. Um, but you know, having just way more intelligent ways to match you know, if you're trying to go and find someone, it's less about like putting out a job description nowadays, I think, and saying, okay, come to me and, and prove to me you've got X, Y, Z, and it's more a, a bit of a, a hunt. And it's like, okay, I want someone to come and do this. Tell me which candidates do you think you know, would be good, and then I'm gonna look through them and kind of match it myself. If we could have a better system like that, um, which, you know, a credible, you know, kind of has a, a foot in that, um, <laughs> would they then start to change the process just because they're gonna get more likely to have higher you know, matches with what they're looking for. Hmm. So I think it's going to be more of a, a sort of cultural change than a sort of systemic or technical one or uh, you know, standards-based one. But the standards are required for those systems to even have a hope of working. Um, so I think we'll, we'll try first. We'll get it kind of half right. Well, then we'll kind of iterate over time, and it'll just get a lot better. And then more and more, we'll be like, yeah, I've got this amazing candidate that would not have come through because they did not have the credentials we usually look for. And this person has risen in the organization so much that we should really change the way we do this. I think, I suspect that's how that's going to be answered. I do have a little thought about it. And, and, and I think this is also where um, what is now becoming uh, the whole area of, um, of predictive analytics in the workforce, to have much better metrics of what I, as an employer, what, what, are, what are the signals that uh, can assure me that I'm uh, getting better performance? Like one metric that, that like time to value, is, is a metric, like how the moment of hire to time of business value mm -hmm. is an important metric. If there can be evidence that uh, different forms of credentials can keep that cost lower, uh, that's what's going to drive a lot of this. So I, think, I think the credentialing world and the predictive analytic world need to um, uh, probably look at some of these issues together uh, uh, because there's a lot going on out there trying to predict um, and, what data, and what data points are essential in being able to predict um, outcomes. So, so I think that's the engineering solution. We get to a data-driven system. Right. There will be benefits and, and some drawbacks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, others, or we should probably wrap up? Oh, no, no. One of the, oh, yeah, there is. Well, should we not do it anyway? Uh, we'll oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll skip the dance number and just go to the question then? 
Was there? Yes? No? Oh, right here in front, I think, yeah. I just wonder if the day will come when instead of employers trying to define skills, which is such a, it's just so hard to imagine any standardized language in that dynamic, varied world ever emerging, especially because there's some proprietary interests at stake, whether they will ask for certain credentials because the world of credentials has evolved to the point where the competencies that that credential represents are both clear and transparent. That is, so that the employer can say, I want this credential, it's got to be from an accredited place or a certain set or industry recognized, but instead of seeking skills and doing ads that list skills, and we see this to some extent now, but it's usually just a marker. They ask for a degree, a BA or something, yeah. and that's just sort of an assurance that somebody is motivated and has a certain basic intelligence. But if that goes to the point of competencies, uh, so that's a chicken and egg sort of problem. The folks who produ produce the credentials, as WGU is doing, need to be to send clear signals about what the competencies involved are that employers can then hopefully start to seek credentials rather than to try to specify skills. Yeah. I think that's the whole point of offering yeah. industry yeah. recognized credentials in the yeah. first place, yeah. Yeah. No, from my perspective. That's good. All right, well, we have to go. Uh, um, so, but thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.